Well, the process of sampling in two and higher dimensions is very analogous to that of sampling in one dimension, which you've already looked at in the context of sampling a time signal. So we're going to look at the two-dimensional case here, and the extension should be straightforward to higher dimensions. We have a signal, f, which is a function of continuous space. So it's a function of x and y, hence the parentheses here to denote that this is a continuous valued function. If we evaluate this signal at intervals m times delta x, and n times delta y, we can call that our sampled signal f of m comma n. So our sampling intervals are delta x and delta y, and we're going to assume that those are measured in units of meters. So then we have two types of frequency. We have the continuous space frequency, which is associated with the original continuous space image, and we'll use uppercase u and uppercase v to denote the frequencies corresponding to the x and y directions. And the units on those will be radians per meter, because we're assuming our distance measure is meters here. In discrete space, we have frequency also, and the units on those are going to be radians. And we'll use lowercase u and lowercase v to denote the discrete space frequency. So just as we did in the continuous time and discrete time case, we're going to relate the Fourier representations for the continuous space signal and the sampled discrete space signal, and that'll help us understand what's happening with sampling. So to begin, recall that in continuous time, we had the discrete time frequency omega was equal to continuous time frequency uppercase omega times the sampling interval. Well, the same relationships apply here in that our discrete space frequency lowercase u is equal to our continuous space frequency uppercase u times the sampling interval delta x. And similarly, the discrete space v is equal to continuous space v times the sampling interval delta y. And delta x and delta y imply sampling frequencies, which will denote as u sub s and v sub s. And the values of those are 2 pi divided by delta x and 2 pi divided by delta y, respectively, with units of radians per meter. So this is all totally analogous to the one-dimensional case. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to not go into quite as much depth here as we did when we developed it for the one-dimensional case. You can fill those gaps in yourself, but we're going to call a sampled continuous space signal, f sub s of x comma y, to be the sum of the samples f of m comma n times impulses, delta of x minus m delta x and y minus m delta y. So we're taking and we're associating an impulse of strength corresponding to the sample at those sample locations in the image. Well, this can be written as the product of f of x comma y times this impulse train in two dimensions. This is exactly what we did in one dimensional sampling theory. And so we have a representation now for the sampled signal f sub s that's expressed in terms of the original signal f of x comma y times this impulse train which I've denoted as s of x comma y. Well, this makes it straightforward to look at things in the frequency domain because we can take the Fourier transform and here on the left we have the product of f and s so that means that in the Fourier space we're going to involve a convolution and I'm not going to keep track of the constants out in front here so we're just going to say that the spectrum f sub s is proportional to the convolution of the original signal spectrum and the Fourier transform of this impulse train s of x comma y, which just like it was in one dimension, an impulse train transforms to an impulse train. The spacing is inversely proportional because originally they were spaced by delta x and delta y in the frequency domain. They're spaced by 2 pi over delta x and 2 pi over delta y. Well, this convolution is straightforward because we're convolving with impulses, so that simply shifts this function 
to the location of the impulses and we end up with our sample signal spectrum is proportional to the sum k over and l minus infinity and infinity of the original signal spectrum shifted to k u sub s and l v sub s and adding all those up. We can sketch this and across the top I have restated the sampling relationship in two dimensions that my sampled signal f sub s of x comma y has Fourier transform f sub s of u comma v which is proportional to the sum over all k and l the original signal spectrum shifted to k u sub s and shifted to l v sub s. So if our original signal spectrum is as I've drawn over here on the left hand side where we have a two-dimensional frequency domain quantity f of u comma v and I'm only showing sort of where it exists I can't really draw in three dimensions so this is coming up out of the page somehow but we're assuming that it lies between a bandwidth of b sub y in the v frequency axis and b sub x along the u frequency axis. So we replicate this signal spectrum at multiples of k of u sub s and multiples of v sub s. So we have our k equals 0, l equals 0 term here in the original location. Then as I move to the right, this is the k equals 1, l equals 0 term in the sum, k equals 2, l equals 0 term in the sum. Going up on the axis, we have the k equals 0, l equals 1 term, k equals 1, l equals 1, k equals 2, l equals 1, and so on. You get all these replicates of the original two-dimensional spectrum are replicated at multiples of the sampling frequencies in x and y. Just as we had before, there's a condition under which we don't have aliasing. In other words, when these replicated spectra don't overlap. And for that to be true, the bandwidth b sub x and b sub y need to be smaller than half of the spacing between these replicates, and that's u sub s and v sub s. The condition for no aliasing is that u sub s, which is 2 pi divided by delta x, has to exceed twice the bandwidth in the x direction. And the sampling frequency v sub s in the y direction, which is 2 pi over delta y, has to exceed twice the bandwidth in that direction. And that will prevent any aliasing. And this leads us to a two-dimensional version of the Nyquist sampling theorem which says that if f sub x, our original image, is band limited to this band minus b sub x to b sub x for u and b sub, minus b sub y to b sub y for v, then we can reconstruct our original image f of x comma y uniquely from the samples f of m comma n which are taken at intervals delta x and delta y, provided that delta x is less than pi over b sub x and delta y is less than pi over b sub y. This basically means that we need to achieve the same sort of two points per cycle sampling that we had to have in the time domain. So if I go in the x direction and I have some sinusoidal variation in that direction of a certain frequency, then I'm going to need to have a minimum of two samples per cycle of that sinusoid. And the same holds, of course, in the y direction. So this would hold in either x or y. And if we have this condition satisfied, then you can think about an idealized reconstruction, which would be to just take a low-pass filter in two dimensions and select out this portion of the spectrum corresponding to the k equals 0, l equals 0 term of the replicated sample signal spectrum. And that would give us back the signal. Now in practice with an image, oftentimes we let the human eye do the low pass filtering. So when we project an image on the screen, we're actually projecting a 
a sampled version of the image and our eye interpolates and does the low pass filtering for us. But these are the conditions to prevent aliasing and the same kind of theory can easily be extended to three dimensions.